Welcome to the Living Schoolyards Act lecture series, exploring the benefits to health, education, community, and climate, and happy International Women's Day. Next slide. Oh, and next slide. Next slide. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm Nancy Strinisty, a Green Schoolyard America's National Policy Liaison, and I invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. Next slide. Oh, and I skipped my two colleagues, Rachel Pringle and Dante Sudolovsky, who are helping today with, um, with this webinar. The Living Schoolyards Act is a groundbreaking bill that will direct important federal resources towards transforming school grounds into living schoolyards, richly layered outdoor environments that strengthen local ecological systems while providing place-based hands-on learning resources for students of all ages. It is incredibly exciting to see this bill in the federal record. This is a huge opportunity to equitably improve the educational experiences and health of children all across the country, as well as the climate and community benefits that we will explore in subsequent sessions. Next slide. The Living Schoolyards Act was introduced in the US Senate by Martin Heinrich, a Democrat from New Mexico in September of 2022. Senator Heinrich will reintroduce the bill in April of this year and Representative Gabe Vasquez, also a Democrat of New Mexico, will introduce it in the House. Right now, what we need is bipartisan co-sponsors in the House and in the Senate. So please reach out to your senators and Congress people. There is a link to the 2022 bill on the webpage, which we'll give you the link for in a second. It is currently undergoing some rewrites, but that's basically the language. Next slide. The, um, the goals of the Living Schoolyards Act lecture series. First is to build a grassroots community of active support for the bill. We know that learning outdoors on living schoolyards is a powerfully engaging way to improve children's academic experiences. And we believe that every child deserves the opportunity for hands-on experiential learning in the out of doors. As we're gonna discuss in subsequent lectures in this series, living schoolyards also offer, offer tremendous physical and mental health benefits, climate and ecological benefits, and community and green, green job benefits. Our next goal is to unite and grow our coalition of organizations. Within the coalition we are building around this bill, there's a huge amount of knowledge, expertise, and on the ground experience. This lecture series will bring us together and draw on that expertise for our speakers. And of course, the main goal is to highlight the many benefits of living schoolyards and create a library of recorded testimony. This library can be used by elected officials and their staffs to understand the benefits of this legislation, and it can be used anytime anyone needs to advocate and educate about the benefits of living schoolyards. Next slide how you can support the Living Schoolyards Act, go to this webpage um, and join the coalition of endorsers for the bill. We are told that when House and Senate offices get lots of emails, calls, and letters, especially on the same day, they take notice. There is contact information and letter writing templates on the webpage so you can find out your senator and representative's addresses. So let's let them hear from us today. You can also get students involved by downloading the student advocacy kit and empowering kids to look closely at their schoolyards and write letters. You can follow us on social media and share our posts. We encourage you to write an op-ed in your local paper. And finally, you can visit the offices of your senators and representatives in Congress and ask and tell them about this bill and how much it would mean to you and to kids. Next slide. 
The first, this first in the series will fo focus on the educational and academic benefits of living schoolyards and of the act when it becomes law. Our speakers today represent regional and national organizations who've been doing this work for decades. In this series, you'll learn about efforts in all regions of the country. Living schoolyards are and can be in any and everywhere. As you listen to our speakers, feel free to post questions in the chat. The Green Schoolyards team will respond when we can, and there will be time for the panelists to respond after they all speak, we hope. Um, we will also be posting research links in the chat and afterwards on our website along with the lecture recordings. So first up, I want to welcome Whitney Cohen, the Education Director well, first, let me tell you who the speakers are going to be. Whitney Cohen, the Education Director for Life Lab, Karen Cow, the CEO of 10 Strands, Liza Lowe, the Director of the Inside Outside Network, and Sarah Boder, the Director of Policy and Affiliate Relations from the North American Association for Environmental Education. And first up now, we want to welcome Whitney Cohen. And Whitney's full bio will be posted in the chat. Welcome, Whitney. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. I'm just thrilled to be here and to be considering and supporting this um, proposed legislation in support of living schoolyards. So next slide, please. A quick little overview of Life Lab. I'm the education director at Life Lab, and we're in Santa Cruz, California. This is land that was originally tended by the Awaswa speaking Uipi tribe and now is stewarded by the Amamutsun tribal band. And here in Santa Cruz since the 1970s, Life Lab has been supporting school gardens and bringing learning to life in school gardens. And so this graphic that you're seeing on the right hand side shows a lot of the local work that we do here with kids in our county, both in schools and on farms. And then on the left hand side shows our national work. Life Lab develops curriculum and trainings for educators that we share all across the country and in fact around the world. And we also are really involved in the national movement for school gardens, hosting gatherings and conferences for school garden practitioners. Next slide, please. So school gardens are often kind of a gateway or a first experience for many schools into the world of living schoolyards. And in my role at Life Lab, I've had the incredible privilege and opportunity to connect with hundreds of school gardens all across the country, as you can see in some of these photos. And it's just so powerful and beautiful to witness the diversity of school gardens from Florida all the way across the country to here in California. Next slide, please. And while so many of the students and the crops and the cultures are very different across these school gardens, in addition to that diversity, there's also tremendous common ground between all of these school gardens. And specifically, <laughs> as you can kind of see in the faces of all of these students in the photos, there's this thread of positive transformation in children's lives. And that's what I'll speak to today and specifically the academic transformation that can happen in a school garden. Next slide, please. We see it firsthand in school gardens. All of us who have seen kids outside know these things. And research also really supports that, that school gardens create opportunities for children to discover a love of nourishing food, a love of learning, and a love of nature, as well as a sense of themselves and a sense of empowerment. And when taken together, those different kind of foundational assets for students help those children grow into adults with the knowledge and the skills and the sense of themselves that they need to care for themselves, to care for one another, and to care for the world around them. The, the um, folks behind the scenes are gonna post the research that's, that I'm speaking to in the chat so you can see those links. Next slide, please. So today our theme of course is equity, education and academic benefits. And so I'm gonna dive now a little deeper into the use of school gardens specifically for science education and bringing equity and centering equity in science education. So at Life Lab, we're actually called Life Lab because we see outdoor school gardens as living laboratories. And these are spaces where students can get curious, wonder about things, see really exciting and strange phenomena and then ask questions and then try to find answers through their own research and observations. Next slide, please. When students are in school gardens and they get to behave in this way as scientists, research shows and firsthand experience shows really positive impacts on their engagement, on their science learning and on their interest in science. 
students. So I'd like to give you sort of some specific examples of how that looks in school gardens here in Santa Cruz and Watsonville. Next slide, please. So the students who you're looking at now are students in one of our schools in Watsonville, California. And these are fourth graders and they just finished a lesson in which they opened up and dissected flowers. And they looked at the different structures inside of the flower to try to determine for themselves how each structure helped the flowers attract pollinators and then transfer pollen to other flowers. And you can look right into their faces and see the sense of engagement, the sense of joy, the sense of accomplishment they felt after having this experience. Now I want to highlight that in this science lesson in particular, this is an example of how hands-on outdoor science in living schoolyards can promote educational equity. Because in order to succeed in this lesson, these students did not have to already know what pollination was. This lesson didn't start with, raise your hand if you could tell me what the definition of pollination was. They didn't need to already know that. They did not need to have access to school buses or parent volunteers who are free to chaperone and drive on a field trip because the living schoolyard in the school garden was right on their campus. They did not need to have planted something in their lives. They didn't need to have an adult at home who could help them with a science worksheet. They didn't need to have um, land at their house. They didn't need to have a big backyard where they could garden for themselves. They didn't need to read at a fourth grade level in English in order to learn independently from a textbook. Instead, in this lesson, every student came together and explored those flowers together, and they got to together make the discoveries as scientists and search for answers to their questions. And so in this way, it promotes equity because everyone started at the same level and was able to make discoveries together. Next slide, please. In addition, to promoting, oh, in addition to promoting equity in science education, this approach also really promotes a sense of science identity. Science identity is a sense that students develop of themselves as belonging in science. And we're going to show you just a very short video of the students at the very end of this lesson that I think perfectly, perfectly illustrates what I mean by science identity. Go ahead, Dante. I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist. Petal seeds, nectar, then a leaf. Thank you. Next slide, please. So as we look at increasing science identity, we can look at the impacts, impacts that that has. And there are tremendous impacts that we know that science identity has on the students them help, themselves. It increases the likelihood that they'll continue to become scientifically literate, developing their scientific ideas and literacy. And also it, in, it increases the likelihood that they'll follow an educational pathway into a science career. Next slide, please. But the benefits even go beyond the students themselves, because as we're realizing, as more young people from groups currently really underrepresented in the field of science begin to see themselves as belonging in the field, there's tremendous benefits for the field of science itself, which of course will only become stronger and richer with more diverse perspectives. Next slide, please. So we talked a little bit about how the school garden can promote science, science identity, science literacy, and equity in science. And now I'm going to take a look a little beyond science and look at how the garden can also provide meaningful real world context in which students can apply language arts and math and more. The things they're practicing in the classroom really come to life in a school garden. So in this slide, here's just one example. These are second grade students who have been looking at seeds and the little mechanisms on the seeds that help them travel. And now after having that hands-on experience and being investigative scientists, the student in this picture on the right is actually speaking to the class using this sentence frame to explain how he thinks the seed travels and why he thinks so. And this is an example where this student is practicing in, in his second language, which is English, speaking in full sentences. And then of course, after that, writing it down. And so getting to practice language arts in a context that really matters to him. And he has a an idea he wants to communicate. Next slide, please. 
The same is true in math, that the garden provides this meaningful context where the students can, for example, measure the volume and the area and the perimeter of a garden bed. And it's meaningful because they have to do that to figure out how much soil they'll need to fill the bed, how far apart to space their plants, etc. They can create bar graphs of the kinds of leaves they're finding or the flavors that they prefer. They can do scavenger hunts for the shapes they're looking at. In this way, again, learning comes to life in the school garden. Next slide, please. This is not a new idea. We did not invent this idea here at Life Lab. Um, and here's a great example of, from George Washington Carver from the early 1900s. And he wrote, a real bug found eating on the child's cabbage plant in his little garden will be taken up with a vengeance in his composition class. He would much prefer to spell the real living radish in the garden than the lifeless radish in the book. He would much prefer to figure on the profit of the onions sold from his garden than those sold from some, by some John Jones of Philadelphia. Next slide, please. So this is why I'm just so thrilled to see this groundbreaking legislation being proposed, because to here today we are quite literally talking about breaking ground, about replacing concrete with vibrant living spaces for young people. And that's an investment in two things, both of which I hold as vital. One, giving youth the educational opportunities that they deserve. And two, growing the leaders that this world needs. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Whitney. Those were fantastic points. We really appreciate that. Um, and next we're gonna hear from Karen Cow, the CEO of 10 Strands. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, good morning. Next slide. That'd be great. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy International Women's Day. Um, glad to be doing this talk on, on this day. And I just invite you to um, think for yourselves what women are inspiring you today. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Wanda Stewart, who's on this call. Um, Wanda's in California, and she spent her day yesterday planting trees. So I'm inspired by that. So welcome, Wanda. And, and if you all just want to think for yourselves who's inspiring you today, that would be, that would be great. And feel free to uh, put it in the chat as well. Um, so our work at Tensions, we're focused on California. We do obviously have pentacles into other places too, but our, our, our focus is California. And we are uh, focused on advancing the environmental literacy of students. Uh, next slide, please. Some of our core initiatives, um, we have six core initiatives that we're working on right now. Pretty much we focus on working, at trying to take things to scale um, equitably. Um, and the last mile, you're working at scale and working as it relates to equity, the last mile of course is the hardest piece. And so I'm very grateful to people like Whitney um, for for all of the work that that that, that she does and, and organizations like her do to attend to the last mile for this work. But some of the things that we're working on, um, we have a statewide project called the Climate Change and Environmental Justice Program or CJUP. That is um, a project that's creating curricular resources for California students and teachers focused on climate change and environmental justice. Uh, we also lead the California Environmental Literacy. That was a group that I formed about six or seven years ago now, fo uh, focused on implementing the state's blueprint for environmental literacy. Um, and then uh, an idea that we incubated inside that is called Eclipse, the Environmental and Climate Change Literacy Project, which we've now spun off. That is focused on working with the schools of education within the UC and the CSU systems in our state um, to work with teachers in a pre-service and an in-service capacity to support them um, teaching environmental literacy as they're coming into the profession and while they're in it. Um, so the top, the first three there really relate to, to, to literacy. The next one, and really this is how, why we're connected to this work, is we were a proud founding partner of the National Outdoor Learning Initiative. That was something that we stood up with Green School Yards America, the Lawrence Hall of Science, San Mateo County Office of Ed, and a cast of a thousand um, in the early days of the pandemic 
and we're also a partner in the newly launched California Schoolyard Forest System. So I'll highlight that in green because that's our connection to this work. Um, we've just recently been um, working in partnership with the Climate Ready Schools Coalition. That is a school building decarbonization effort. Um, and then the last thing that we're working on is a dashboard that helps school districts and counties and school districts and schools understand where they're at with respect to whole school sustainability. So you can see by all of that, that, that it's really, we're, we're trying to get at scale in a place as, as, as big and complicated as California. Okay, next slide, please. I have a blender in. With, um, we just also want to, I just want to say also that we endorse 100% um, the Schoolyard Act of 2022 by Senator Heinrich. The parts of that act that are particularly appealing to us um, are the things I've listed here on the right, the fact that it calls for community input, that it calls for ecological goals as well as educational goals, and then of course the professional, the necessary professional learning supports for teachers. Um, that picture of the kids um, on the left there is in Santa Cruz, uh, just so you know, Whitney, so we've been down there too. <laughs> so next slide please. So just backing up a little before I show you some data um, um, in, my, in my later slides, but I just wanna say, and we, I felt this when we launched the National Outdoor Learning Initiative as well, that these ideas are not new ideas and, and, and there are places around the world who have been pushing heavily on this for decades and we have to, and we have to keep doing it, right? But I went, you know, I was looking at remembering rather Article 29 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. You know, that's 34 years ago. Article 29 uh, is focused on education. And the, that little paragraph there that I've got in quotes is the, um, is the child-friendly version of the article. Um, but children's education should help them fully develop their personalities, talents, and abilities. It should teach them to understand their own rights and to respect other people's rights, cultures, and differences. And then the thing I underscored here was it should help them to live peacefully and protect the environment. So we're talking about, you know, literally decades now of research and policy and funded implementation um, at, internationally. And, and we, we just need to keep pushing for that for us too here. In my, in my own home country, country of origin, next slide, please. So I grew up in Scotland, if you can tell from my accent and in the latest position statement from Scotland's National Outdoor Learning Report, the opening sentence says it all for me. Playing and learning outdoors is life enhancing. Like I don't need to go further than that. Playing and learning outdoors is life enhancing. But to back it up and to tie it to some of the research that Whitney was talking about, playing and learning outdoors improves physical health, mental, social and emotional well-being, development of essential social skills, boosting of creativity, imagination, and understanding, um, prepares children and young people for more structured learning, thereby supporting the aims of national education policies, kind of the focus of, of the work at 10 Strands, a sense of place and a feeling of belonging and inclusion, and an understanding of the value um, and the joy of protecting the natural world. And all of this is backed up by research. Whitney talked about it, the next speaker will talk about it, and the next speaker will talk about it. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's all good, um, but what's going on in schools right now and how might we tie what's going on in schools right now to these ideas that we're expressing? So recently I was at a conference in Sacramento, uh, the PACE conference, it was a policy conference. Um, Kevin Gee, an associate professor from UC Davis presented the following data. Next slide, please. So, I'm gonna talk about ELA, I'm gonna talk about math, and I'm gonna talk about student health and well-being. I've just got six slides that, that, that cover this at the highest level. So I, what I'm saying is <laughs> um, that outdoor learning and play is a solution, not the solution, because I know it's complicated, but it's a solution to the severe education and equities that we're dealing with right now. So this slide shows um, the percentage of pupils who were percentage of students who were meeting or exceeding ELA standards pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So pre on the left and post on the right. And in every grade, there's a decline. 
with the steepest, st steepest decline for third grazers. Next slide, please. If you look at subgroups, I'm using that term because they did. If you look at that subgroup, that you, you can see that before the pandemic, English language learners and Black or African American students were um, least likely to be meeting or exceeding standards. After, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, every single group um, declined. And these two subgroups remain um, at the lowest level, right? So they declined too. Everybody declined and they declined too, okay? Um, next slide, please. So these are the numbers for math. Um, same story. In every grade level, there was a decline and the steepest de decline for eighth graders. And if you look at the subgroups, next slide, the same. So what we're looking at here is we're saying that it looks like fewer than 10% of students in the English lang language learner subgroup were meeting or exceeding standards in math. And about, it looks like about 15%, only 15% of black and African-American students. So when we're designing for equity, we've got, we've got a starting point uh, here. Okay, next slide. Uh, related to social emotional learning, um, in, a, in a survey that was conducted in 2022 of high school students, 77% said they were lacking motivation, 72% said they were feeling overwhelmed, and 63% described having some kind of emotional breakdown in the prior year or the year following the pandemic. Um, next slide, please. When those same students were asked where they got help, 57% of them reported that they got help from nowhere. Okay, so this is my last slide. So I just, I mean, the, the, the math that I'm doing is if this is the current state, this is, these are California, this is California data. If this is the current state of um, where students are at, and we know that outdoor learning and play provides all of the benefits that we've just talked about um, across all of those different research categories that we talked about, then the math is simple. <laughs> that, that, that for me, this, this has to be, uh, one of the solutions that we employ to support our students. So I will leave it there and, and pass it to the next, back to Nancy, I think, and then to the next speaker. Thanks. Phew, thank you so much, Karen. Um, from the perspective from California that I'm sure is reflected in, in all 50 states. Um, we're going to move across the country now and hear from Liza Lowe, who is the director of the Inside Outside Network. Welcome, Liza. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so my name is Liza Lowe, and I'm affiliate faculty at Antioch University. I teach a course in our nature-based early childhood certificate program here in Keene, New Hampshire. I work and live on the unceded lands of the Abenaki people or Abenaki people. And in my work with teachers, I'm on a path of learning and understanding the Abenaki relationships to the land and place and welcoming children into that learning as well. Next slide, please. I'm also the director of Inside Outside, which is a project of Antioch University. And it's a professional network for educators who are using nature, place, and the outdoors for teaching and learning. And it's truly a resource for all of you. Um, our purpose, uh, Inside Outside's purpose, is to support, connect, and partner with educators and educational institutions throughout the United States to empower teachers to confidently, safely, and joyfully venture outdoors with children to teach and learn with nature. Um, next slide, please. This network has been a grassroots movement that started in 2018 at the request of teachers who were connected to Antioch University's uh, nature-based education certificate, certificate program. And it's been growing to include all educators ever since. Um, so started with a focus on early childhood, and now it's really for all, all educators. Um, and it started here in the Northeast and it's grown. We even have a chapter out in Colorado. Teachers are amazingly valuable and such a key component to our society and our educational systems. We want to support them in their efforts to connect children with nature. And Inside Outside has been a way to intentionally forge relationships between formal education, informal education, and community-based education. Next slide, please. 
So I'm going to share with you a, just a couple of slides of some research. These infographics that come from the Children in Nature Network, which if you don't already know about them, they are an amazing resource and they're truly an amazing hub for uh, relevant research to this field. So um, these infographics are amazing because they kind of condense a lot of information in um, these easy to digest, uh, well, infographics. Um, so Children in Nature Network, um, is offering this, this idea of mental health benefits to spending time outside. So time outdoors reduces anxiety, enhances positive emotions, decreases negative emotions. Nature can help children focus and create more enthusiastic le learners. It supports creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving. And if there's a way to improve mental health, as Karen and Whitney have already talked about, um, now is the time. And if the time outdoors can contribute, well, then that seems like a, a great path. Next slide, please. There are also um, academic benefits to spending time in nature. And so this shows us um, uh, things like improving impulse control, having less disruptive behaviors, improving focus and attention. Next slide, please. And also um, teaching and learning outdoors provides opportunities for children to move their bodies and be physically active. And, and I say children, and we often, I think that uh, gives us an image of very young children, but really students of all ages. Um, children who are connected with nature are more likely to have pro-environmental behaviors and they come to know their place and they wanna take care of it. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just an infographic around um, nature as a pathway for healing from adverse childhood experiences. And so um, if we think about adverse childhood experiences, certainly the pandemic and COVID has been that for all of our students. And I continue to hear this language of learning loss, which I just wanted to speak to to say um, that it comes across to me as a sort of fear-based perspective that I can't help but think must negatively impact on our students and our teachers. And so I, I wonder what the value is um, in what we're measuring right now. And I, I wanna invite us all into reframing our thinking to be more about our shared experiences um, and shared experiences where there's positivity. And I think teaching and learning outdoors could be one way to do that. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna share with you some pictures and, and short stories of students who are going outside, teachers who are taking them outside. Um, so you can continue to sort of wrap your mind around what this could look like. Um, teaching outdoors and teaching with nature, it does not have to be an add-on. It can be integrated into so much of what students uh, learning, what students are learning, and it can be powerful, a very powerful way for them to learn. And there's a lot of joy involved and it's truly an incredible way of learning. And I think, I think it's the way we should all be learning. Um, so this is a picture of some students um, in New York City at PS 185. And you can see that they're learning outdoors on their um, constructed playground in the winter, and then also using some uh, land nearby their school and other green spaces. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of children learning in New Hampshire and Vermont um, on the, the grassy space just behind their school. And then, you know, another example of uh, students going out into the woods to learn and play and explore. Next slide, please. Um, in the Portland Public Schools, they now have an outdoor and experiential learning coordinator. And between her and the Living Schoolyards teacher from Portland Public Schools, they're doing truly inspirational work. And so this is just a picture, not just, this is a picture of uh, high school students doing a walking field trip to learn about high water mark in their sustainability studies. Uh, so again, when we think about it not being an add-on and being integrated into what's already happening. Next slide, please. Um, children, again, in Portland Public Schools enjoying pine needle tea in February, and you can see that they were reading a story and other things happening, and it looks to me like they're having fun. Next slide, please. Um, fourth graders planting bulbs, learning about the sky through a cloud viewer. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, and oh, hi, okay, high school students. Um, using a nearby tidal area 
and they're doing a transect. So this could, you know, this could be done perhaps something similar on their school land and they've taken it a step further and use land nearby um, to, to extend their learning. Next slide, please. And before I go on, I just wanna say that uh, these pictures, it would be really hard to do any of this in the classroom. Uh, so just thinking about getting outside of the classroom to learn. Um, I wanna say that teachers can benefit from spending time outside as well. Um, so here's a picture uh, Antioch offers in Bloom conferences in the spring. And this was a conference that happened in Delaware. And so teachers in this scenario in, the, in these pictures are learning about um, the sh shad bush. And it's a collective, this is an example of what a school could do. It's a collaboration between an urban and community forestry state coordinator, a director of DEI from a local school and a STEM educator. And they're all providing students with meaningful watershed educational experiences and rich opportunities for cross-curriculum understanding. And here at the InBloom Conference in Delaware, educators were learning how to provide a hands-on immersive experience specific to the history of the American shad, indigenous people in the shad bush. And this particular workshop included historical and contemporary indigenous connection, human impacts on the environment and restoration of the shad migration to the Brandywine River in Delaware and Pennsylvania, including the perspective of Afro-indigenous people. Next slide, please. And teachers, uh, one of the things that Inside Outside offers are local chapters. And so this is a picture of the Delaware chapter of Inside Outside, uh, their most recent gathering where they came together outdoors and it looks like they were stretching and learning together. Next slide, please. Um, and just uh, wanting to emphasize the benefit of teachers doing their own learning outside as well. The more they learn, the more they can pass that on to their students. Next slide, please. Oh, just kidding. So that is the end of my presentation and I'll hand it back to Nancy. Thank you so much, Liza. That was so powerful in so many ways. We really appreciate having you here. I love the Inside Outside Network. Um, our final speaker today is going to pull it all together for us. Sarah Boder is the Director of Policy and Affiliate Relations, Relations for NAAAE, the North American Association for Environmental Education. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Nancy. And wow, I, I sure hope I'm going to pull it all together. I've been so inspired listening to um, our previous speakers, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be here with you all today. Um, just very briefly, if you're not familiar with NAAEE, um, we are uh, a professional association for environmental and outdoor educators. We serve as a backbone organization for the field, and our mission, which you can see on the screen, is to leverage the power of education to advance environmental literacy and civic engagement for a more just and sustainable world. And our networks are made up of educators in both formal and non-formal settings, as well as policymakers and partners. Next slide, please. Some of the ways that we go about our work uh, in order to achieve our mission is we focus a lot on research to practice. So using a lot of the types of research that's been shared here with you today, um, to inform practice, uh, particularly through our series of guidelines for excellence in environmental education and ensuring a level of quality in the field of environmental education. We also do quite a bit of advocacy work. Um, that's one of my areas of focus and policy tracking. And um, I mentioned we're a backbone organization. We uh, along with our network, provide a certain level of infrastructure support for the field. Rather than direct programming, uh, we provide a lot of support structures. Next slide, please. And a really critical part of that infrastructure supporting the field of environmental education comes from our affiliate network. We have state, regional, and provincial affiliate organizations across North America, and these organizations in turn have their own broad networks of environmental and outdoor educators. Some of these educators might be classroom teachers, but very often they're community-based program providers who can really be essential partners to teachers in schools who are looking to start or expand an outdoor learning initiative at school or in the community. And you've heard some really great examples of those today. If you're not familiar with your own uh, state environmental and outdoor education association, I would really encourage you to check them out. 
Next slide. So you've already heard really great examples today of the research and evidence that green schoolyards are a vibrant context for transformative learning opportunities. But very often, as you've also heard, they are an untapped resource for teaching and learning. And that's one of the reasons why NAAEE and I personally am so excited about the Living Schoolyards Act and the promise that it holds to make rich and rewarding outdoor learning more accessible to more students. Next slide. And just to underscore and elaborate on the volume of research um, and, and really growing body of research that supports environmental and outdoor education as a proven practice for supporting students' academic achievement, um, I wanna just share this graphic from our EE Works initiative which I'll share a little bit more about in a minute, but just studies consistently and really frankly overwhelmingly show that environmental education helps increase knowledge and not just environmental knowledge. Um, and in fact, we now know as has been shared with the other speakers today um, that knowledge gains um, are just at the tip of the iceberg and that in fact, environmental education supports academic achievement across subject areas. It helps build really essential skills such as critical thinking and problem solving. It fosters engagement and personal growth and so much more. And I know that in later um, episodes of this lecture series, you're gonna have the opportunity to learn a lot more about some of the mental and physical health benefits, uh, which have been touched on today, but can be um, shared in much greater detail on future uh, webinars. Next slide. So um, researchers at Stanford University have analyzed and distilled uh, well over 100 peer-reviewed studies on the impacts of environmental education on student outcomes in uh, grades kindergarten through 12th grade. And this is part of our EE Works Research to Practice initiative. And I think uh, the links for some of these findings and the research summaries are being dropped in the chat box. But really what they found is that um, there really are essentially whole child benefits to environmental and outdoor learning. And I really love this quote. Our previous speakers have touched on this um, really beautifully, I think, but about how the hands-on learning um, that takes place in on the school grounds and in outdoor settings really becomes an equalizer um, for students of all different learning styles and learning abilities. And uh, just the example uh, that Whitney shared at the outset um, that students don't have to have a lot of prior experience to come to these lessons ready to dig in and discover and explore um, is just really exciting um, and really um, just suggests that the environment is this context where kids who might otherwise struggle in a traditional classroom with a traditional uh, curriculum can just really shine. Next slide. So another thing that I think is really interesting to point out um, is that um, this new, this groundbreaking legislation, the Living Classrooms Act, is coming at uh, just the right time um, with interest in outdoor learning on the rise. And this graphic, which comes from the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, um, reflects um, how state legislators have been engaging in the topic of outdoor learning on social media. And obviously the pandemic and the related school closures is most likely the cause for the sudden spike um, in uh, uh, between 2019 and 2022. Um, but I think that um, this spike in interest is really providing um, a tremendous opportunity for those of us who advocate for this um, type of education. And it's really a hopeful sign that what has historically been considered just a nice to have is gaining traction as a real urgent need for student success, health, and well-being. Next slide. So I just want to underscore that sort of growing traction and interest that sort of sprung out of some of the challenges thrown at us by the pandemic. Um, that we're seeing policies and programs sprouting up across the country in an effort to provide more support, more funding, more resources, and certainly more equitable access. Um, these are just a few examples. I always hesitate to call things out because you're always missing some key examples and there are always folks on the, um, in the audience who know way more about the, these efforts than I do. But um, I just wanna point out that you know everything from efforts to um, ensure that all students have opportunities to participate in outdoor school programming, whether those are residential or 
um, we're hearing a lot more talk about on-site immersive outdoor school experiences in school grounds and adjacent public lands as a way to um, make sure that access is equitable. Um, in New Mexico, where um, the Living Schoolyards Act is sort of born, um, the Department of Education recently hired its first outdoor learning coordinator. Um, we're seeing grant programming um, um, in places like uh, Georgia and Rhode Island to help support more learning outdoors. Um, so this is a really exciting trend and often um, these programs match schools and classroom teachers with community based partners who can really help to deliver teacher professional development and high quality programs. Next slide. So, you know, just a quick word about community based partners and the value that they bring. Um, they often um, can bring culturally relevant student education experiences onto the uh, school ground. Many of them offer teacher professional development. They have expertise in curriculum design. Uh, there are many organizations who can provide te technical support for improving outdoor spaces. They sometimes have grant funding or can be the recipient of grant funds and take on the administrative burden of grants um, to alleviate some of the stress uh, on especially smaller schools or school districts. Um, and then importantly, they also serve as advocates to ensure that we are constantly working towards more equitable access. Next slide. Um, and then the last thing I just want to share is that we too really feel strongly that teachers need to participate in um, outdoor opportunities and gain those same benefits. Um, and so a bunch of our affiliates are launching this spring a campaign called Outside for Five, which is meant to encourage teachers to take their students outdoors for just five minutes a day um, as an easy entry point for them. Teachers are under a lot of pressure these days. And so the idea here is to give them a simple and achievable goal connect them with community partners who can help them and hopefully introduce them to the benefits of learning outside, not only for their students, but for themselves as well. And we see this campaign as a great uh, opportunity uh, for NAAEE affiliates and their networks to become champions for the Living Classrooms Act in their own communities. Um, and I just want to end by saying that to the extent that I can speak on behalf of our networks um, and community-based partners, we are really ready to um, to become champions for the Living School Yards Act to help make sure that it passes, and then when it does, to make sure that it's implemented effectively. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, and all of our speakers. Um, our, our vision was to kind of start with school gardens, because that's where we think lots of schools do start with outdoor learning. That's the kind of gateway. And um, Whitney did an amazing job with that. And then we heard from Karen and Liza, who from opposite coasts gave us a lot of really good background on how basically anything from climate education and environmental literacy to, to literacy and math and science can all be taught outside and with so much joy and engagement by children. Um, and Sarah, I think, did a beautiful job summing it all up and helping us think about both the advantages and benefits to teachers of taking their classes outside, but also the potential of community partners to support schools in what might be a new, new endeavor when this bill passes. We have a few minutes for to answer some of your questions and then We'll come, I'll, I'll come back and do a little closing for us about the rest of the series. Um, I have, um, Nancy, I have um, <clears throat> taken some of the questions from the chat. Feel free to put some more in if you have one. Um, but this one came into the chat is a, a great one for any of our panelists, but maybe particularly um, Whitney and, and Liza. Um, it's, it's this, thinking of that last mile, what are some of your favorite tips for helping convince administrators and educators who are not necessarily early adopters to get on board? This is a great question and one that comes up and I invite any of the panelists to, to, to address that. Maybe Whitney or Liza might have something. I'm happy to kick us off if that sounds good. Um, two things come to my mind in terms of this question. One is 
dream big, start small. So in schools that don't yet have any living schoolyard, I think having a small, easy to maintain kind of um, initial setup, then people can see the kids come spark to life. They can see these incredible benefits we're talking about, and then they get excited for more. Uh, and I have seen the opposite also when schools get really excited or, you know, a certain group of parents rallies for like an acre, blah, blah, and then it, and then it's just too much and everyone gets overwhelmed. So I think starting small with something that's really easy to maintain um, is a great way to kind of bring people and starting with the people who are already excited and then let that let that speak for itself. And then the second thing I think of is um, what I could consider, I used to be a, a classroom science teacher and kind of speaking the love language of the teachers, which is content standards, really becoming familiar with what are the teachers required to teach? How can we use this outdoor space that we've created to support that so that it doesn't feel like an extra thing? It feels like, oh, great, they're going to help me cover bar graphs, or they're going to help me get kids excited about reading or about pollination and photosynthesis or the things that they have to teach at each grade. So becoming really familiar with that and looking for ways to support that. I think those are two key ideas that come to mind for me on that. And another thought I have is just if, if they're already, if you, the person asking the question is an early adopter and they are taking students outside already to invite your administrator or another teacher out with you, um, so that they can see what it looks like in the learning that's happening. Um, and I think, you know, another idea is asking that your staff meeting, that us staff meeting happen outdoors. And even if you're willing to lead uh, an activity or something, like if you're the person who feels comfortable and confident, or you have a colleague, another teacher in the building who could be that person, ask about having a staff meeting outside and leading activity and then just check in with people to see how they feel afterward. Because a lot of times uh, we feel better and we and we like it. So, you know, that's another way to think. That's great, Whitney and Liza, thank you. We had another comment um, from another person in the chat to say that if you can have a principal or an educator speak to an early adopter, uh, one of their colleagues, they often listen to a colleague. Um, so if another principal is doing it, another educator is doing it, those can be really great testimonials. Um, another question, a, a broad question that is a great one and often comes up too is about maintenance. And um, and this relates back to this previous question about um, getting people on board. Maintenance can be a barrier often. Um, and how can schools or um, coalitions or groups of parents or whoever's trying to lead the charge on taking learning outdoors, how can they address this issue of maintenance? And in particular, how can, um, you know, what is, what are the, what are the steps to uh, engaging the larger community of the school district, whether that's buildings and grounds or um, custodians or um, gardeners, et cetera. So um, if our panelists would be, uh, can answer that piece about uh, maintenance, that would be wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I think when we've seen successful approaches, um, it's, it's when this work is acknowledged as interdisciplinary. And so if it's only driven by, I don't know, the curriculum instruction people on a, on a, on a site, it's, it's likely to not get very far. So when we've looked at places that have been able to move, <laughs> um, they've pulled together at the very beginning an interdisciplinary team. And they don't actually do anything until they all know each other and talk to each other and get their concerns out and then and then the planning can start from there so that's just yeah that's what we've noticed yeah and interdisciplinary like as well just thinking about the pulling in um other community members right so it doesn't just have to be the um, facilities person in the school, we can reach out to foresters and other people, parks and recs to build a sort of like mini coalition of people in the community who have all sorts of ideas and resources and knowledge that can be shared, right? Because our it's great if our public schools or any of our schools can be um, have a relationship with the community as well. I would also just add to that that I, I wholeheartedly agree, and I think that can actually help to address some of the funding issues as well. 
Um, so often I have conversations with folks in district administration about some of the available streams of funding, but they might not touch that money or have any say in how that money is going to get disseminated. So getting the right folks together to start having conversations about what your shared objectives are is really, um, it's, it can be a big barrier, but it also can be a big solution. Thank you. And we're also having some of our panelists and other folks um, posting some great links in the chat. So please check those out. Um, so thank you for addressing the maintenance. Um, we are there any examples, um, either Liza or any of any of our panelists, really, that have um, engaged parents and whole families in the outdoors, not just educators and students, um, but kind of brought in a more of a community approach. Um, if anybody has um, some thoughts about that on the panel, that would be wonderful. Or if you have something to share in the chat, please do. One of the things that we did with a, um, a, a school nearby, and I know other schools that have done this, is actually hold an open house, but an, uh, an open outdoor house. <laughs> so it's not inviting people into the school necessarily. It's inviting them to do activities on the land. So whatever that looks like, whatever your land is, even if it's a neighboring park, you know, right now, if that's what you have, um, but just inviting them in, have an activity, have uh, teachers and different people there who can greet them and, and welcome them. And if you can get the students to do, to like um, lead people around in something that can be super impactful, not only for family members, but community members and your administrators as well. So when we're thinking about showing superintendents and principals, what this work is look like, you know, to have the students actually showcase their work. The recording of this session is going to be available soon, and we invite you to join us for the upcoming sessions, Tuesday, March 28th at 11 Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern. The focus will be on a really deep dive into the mental and physical health benefits um, that we've touched on today. The speakers will include Nilda Costco from the Natural Learning Initiative, Claire Latine, the author of Schools That Heal, Design with Mental Health in Mind, and C Stacey Stryer, who is a pediatrician with Parks Rx America. The series will continue with three more sessions in April and May. We're going to talk about the climate and ecological benefits, the community and green job benefits that we touched on a little bit today. And then we're going to wrap it all up with a session on design approaches to creating living schoolyards. Um, and what, next slide. So just to repeat, please take the information and inspiration from our incredible speakers and reach out today to your senators and your representatives. They need to hear from us and they need to understand how important this legislation is to students all across America. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>